I'm Jim Caldwell. I'm, uh, I've come into this industry from a very circuitous route. I was a, a military translator, worked in the security service, translating Chinese for about five years. Then I went to college and I got a degree in comparative politics, organizational behavior, and uh, cross-cultural communications. So I taught the university for 15 years, and then I joined a company to introduce um, the first software that would allow people to input Chinese text. I could type Chinese 120 words a minute with that software. Uh, it's called uh, Tianma, uh, Heavenly Horse. And uh, I lived in China for uh, selling that product, introducing it to people. And then after that, I joined the um, Unicode Consortium, and we designed the first operating system that could operate in all languages. So I had to work with standards files all over the world and argue with engineers all over the world about how to be, how the software ought to work. So um, that prepared me for, uh, um, we went through the, uh, you know, the first uh, peak oil crisis in the 80s. And I taught a lot about that at the university, but in, after 2000, I, I joined the company to um, promote green energy and system integration and global integration. So now we're using IoT, and one of the points that I will make is that IoT is not just about internet of things, it's about people. The, 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 all these tools are tools for people to use. So at the Green Energy Council, it's a U.S. China Green Energy Council, we're building relationships between U.S. and Chinese companies to collaborate to serve cities and communities, uh, including the buildings we live in. Thank you. Uh, Neil Sola is a visualization expert, consultant, who does have many uh, cameras. So we have to uh, first of all, thanks uh, Nate, for inviting me. Uh, in terms of background, I've been, uh, for all my career, working on visualization technology, in contact with Started my career in 3D graphics, developing GPU for CAD camera applications for computer vision and camera uh, systems. And then I moved into zero animation operations part of the APEC Food Standards Committee and you probably know APEC Food is the basis for all of the cable which is uh, videos of broadcasting, satellite broadcasting, and the rest of the videos. I joined Intel about 10 years ago. Um, I recently left Intel, but at Intel, I worked on digital theory of TV and set up of systems for This IoT event, our focus is on uh, uh, smart building and uh, uh, related. So let's start with uh, Kelly, so, uh, how uh, Fremont City can attract uh, okay, competitive America, uh, advantage over other cities, attract the IoT entrepreneur come to Fremont. Thanks, Ming. Um, I think I'll focus on, on three things. It's, it's really about people, it's about place, and it's about partnerships. Um, the people, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the people who are probably poised and most ready uh, to work on IoT projects are, are likely already living in Fremont. And when we go and visit companies like Wellex, we're always surprised at how many of the people who work at our uh, companies who are working on IoT products 
live here as well. Which quite unusual for the Bay Area. Um, Bay Area typically draws from the entire Bay Area. Uh, but from that perspective, I would also mention for those uh, employees who aren't already here, um, this is one of the easier places to get to. It's a reverse commute from the peninsula and the South Bay. And it's also bartable from San Francisco, Oakland, and the entire East Bay. So that's a huge advantage. Getting the right employer employees and then getting them to your work site is, is very important. Uh, place is important as well, and I think of that uh, in terms of the amenities that are coming, like BART and other things, but also in terms of the supply chain that exists here, the opportunity to collaborate with the different um, industries, uh, as was uh, mentioned or in Bruce's presentation, there's a lot of interweaving um, going on with the Internet of Things, and that is so much more possible in a place like Fremont that represents so many different industries in such a powerful way. Uh, but last but not least, uh, the partnership piece is important as well, not only the partnership, the B2B partnership, but the city views itself as a partner and there's a couple of ways that we do that. Uh, we've been fiercely pro uh, protective of our industrial land, which is uh, all Bay Area residents know, it's been slowly converting over to housing just about everywhere. Uh, we put a stake in the ground and said uh, our industrial land is going to be used for industrial purposes and therefore preserve the opportunity for companies like yours to grow. And then there are particular um, incentives, if you will, things that we have in our business cost structure that are very attractive. For example, uh, we're one of a few cities that does not have a user utility tax. And when cities get low on money, the first thing they think of is, oh, we'll, we'll do a user utility tax and that will generate um, you know, tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the city. And so it's a quick, easy fix um, in city government that we've you know, very intentionally decided not to do because it adversely affects our um, industrial tenants who are often big energy users and uh, depend on not having that tax. And then uh, for two particular sectors, clean tech and biotechnology, uh, we have done something very specific for them, which is to waive their business license tax for five years. And the idea behind that is that we recognize there's a long lead time to market for both of those industries for different reasons. Uh, for clean tech, because you're doing something completely new and inventive and it's going to take a while to develop that product. Um, in biotechnology, it's usually because there's FDA approval needed, which takes a while. So we view ourselves as an early investor <laughs> in those companies. And while you're working on becoming profitable, we're not going to give you a business license tax. And hopefully we will mutually share in the future success uh, when those products go to market. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, next one, I will say, uh, uh, Neil, since uh, you are in the camera, right, right now, the camera security for smart homes, smart building are very popular for IoT. So uh, I'd like to, uh, you talk about uh, how to apply your camera technology you know, through the smart home to the smart city. Okay. So uh, try to cover, cover it in general fashion. Uh, basically, when you, when you look at IoT, I mean, sensors are a key part of the, the ecosystem and the, and the value chain. And in my opinion, the cameras is, is just a type of sensor. The big difference is many of the sensors send particular specific data, you know, temperature, vibration, accelerometer, etc. In terms of camera as a sensor, what you're capturing is the environment, and how do you interpret that environment? You know, what do you get out of that? And that is a big difference between how a camera, you know, data captured by camera can be turned into information. Right? And I, th I think you made a very useful distinction there between data and information is how do you analyze that piece of information? Something falls out on the high highway, you know, some easy example. There's a bump in the highway that wasn't there, you know, but some object fell on the highway. You know, how do you recognize how you know, high that object is? Is that really dangerous for the traffic or is it not? You know, it can be just a flat piece of plywood or it can be something that you know, six, nine inches, one foot high. So the visual understanding of things as part of the IoT chain, right, compute chain or, or information chain is very important. The other aspect of imaging or video is that the data space, the amount of data that is required is very large. So where do you process that data? You know, you can be sending all of that to the cloud, but that's quite expensive. And so 
figuring out how much of that data can be processed locally, analyzed locally, and then consumed locally. And that is all experience dependent, right, or, or application usage dependent. And how can that be reduced if it has to be sent to the cloud so that it can be then processed, only the, the relevant information can be sent to the cloud and then it can be processed there. And then how do you connect different things together? You know, in smart cities, you're going to have cameras all over the place. How do you connect that those cameras? And I think in the future, those cameras may not be just the city cameras, but they will be cameras that individuals are placed outside their homes, et cetera. And how do you connect all of that data to create and extract valuable, valuable information, relevant information, that can then benefit the larger public and not just the person that has the camera in front of his house. Right. So some of, some of those are the aspects. And then I think it's also now uh, going forward to augmented reality, virtual reality drones, what those devices are doing, right? And again, it's similar processing, but done for a different usage, different application, and has very different nuances in terms of the size of the camera or the you know, performance of the camera. So the device characteristics or the sensor characteristics, the amount of processing required, and where is that processing best done? And then how do you make those devices smart, whether they are in the home or in the building or in a drone? And how much capability do you offer versus how much do you relegate to the web or the cloud? I think are going to be key aspects to consider for all this time. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, now from the small uh, home and building, I think uh, we turn to the big picture of uh, Jim Caldwell for your uh, green community and the green city, okay? How do you uh, using the IoT innovative product apply to your uh, business, okay? Thank you. That's right on target. Um, so you talked about gathering the right data and putting it in the right place and processing it in the right place. And bottom line for the health of a city is how do you get it to the people who can make a difference, right? And so um, I belong to Smart City Council, which um, and, and the meeting of the minds, which we'll meet in October in in Richmond, uh, talking about that issue. How do you get the data that you gathered, analyzed, um, put it into categories that you think are the right categories? to the people who can actually create solutions and make the life of the city better. And um, the Smart Cities Council has come up with a, uh, a statement that you know that the data that is gathered about cities is a mother load of opportunity. It has got opportunities for jobs for everybody and for people to create solutions for everything if you can get that data to the people who actually can make that those decisions and make those inventions. And so that's the, 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 uh, the challenge for cities right now. How do you distribute it? And while you're doing that, how do you keep it secure so the wrong data doesn't get to the wrong people? Um, all that's possible, but it's, uh, it is, a, it, and that's part of the opportunity that that's ahead of us, is to create those kind of flexible solutions. And different city departments can actually collaborate with each other instead of conflicting with each other over budgets or, or various things, personnel. Okay, all right, great. Then uh, we got all these uh, you know, solution ideas, but uh, Bruce Sinclair, he talked about uh, you know, the connect devices versus IoT products. So how do you think, how do you apply those uh, you know, connect device into the Smart city or green building or green energy application, okay? Um, well, it's all the same. So I just recently interviewed Gamino. Gamino, he's the CIO of San Francisco. And we were talking explicitly about how do you set up an infrastructure? But if you look at it from a bigger picture point of view, he's trying to build the city as a platform. And that means it all starts out with the connectivity. And so you, you have the connectivity, pervasive uh, connectivity. You have different types of connectivity. They just did a, an agreement, I don't know if everyone is familiar with, with Sigfox, but it's a low power wide area network um, that they just installed within San Francisco. So if you look at it from a city point of view, it's the same thing. You've got a bunch of sensors, whether they're cameras, 
whether they're other types of sensors, you're bringing them together, you're doing some local processing, and you're transforming that data into some information. You go down a level. So now we're in a smart building. It's the exact same thing. You're putting sensors, let's say it's just as simple to know if you have both heat and air conditioning coming out in the same room. Or if you have a fan blowing, but the damper is shut. So you want to, again, you want to build a model for the city, you want to capture that data for the, for the building, you want to capture that data, and then transform into something useful. Then you go down to the actual um, HVAC, you know, the heating and, the, and the, the heating and the cooling, and it's the exact same thing. So really it's just, a, it's just an, an issue of dimension. And when you talk about um, a smart city versus a smart building versus a smart product, what I learned from my discussion, and it's uh, my latest podcast if anyone wants to hear it, when I learned from my discussion with, with Miguel, it's all the amount of politics involved. <laughs> so the hard part in reality is not so much the technology, it's not the hardware, it's not the software. The hard part um, generally, uh, at least when we start talking about smart cities, is in the wetware and that's the different people. The politics, right, and that's my specialty is politics. Politics is about, you know, every person experiences an event differently based on their own background and their own past experience. So people will argue about things because they experience them differently. And, and our goal would be to give them the right information so they can see, okay, your experience tells part of the story, mine tells part of the story, how can we come up with a solution that will meet both of our needs or correct our false impressions of what's going on in a, in a friendly way. Okay. So the next one we will have Sanji because now Intel is in the investment, Intel Capital in investment. So what's your criteria? Also the selection, how do you judge, how do you invest all these uh, IoT, okay, innovations, entrepreneur, or startup, or you know, the late stage, how do you select? Uh, um, so when we look at IoT startups, uh, we try to understand what the product is and what the business model is. And the reason I mention it sounds generic, but the reason I mention that is particularly for IoT, business model has been a challenge to a great extent. Um, consumer IoT startups particularly have that challenge even stronger because I, I, you, you can start connecting three devices in the home, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, maybe your uh, TV, etc., etc. But if I said, hey, how many people will pay $49.99 a month for that connectivity and you will get all of that control on your mobile app, people are not going to pay that. And that's where the fundamental challenge is on business model side for consumer IoT companies. On enterprise IoT, it's a whole different story. If you build a product for a manufacturing company, for example, Velix as an example, where a technician can go in and view the pressure gauge or manufacturing statistics in real time using a sensor or control it remotely using an app or wear a helmet, smart helmet, in augmented reality, it can look at it and tell you, hey, here's what you need to do. You can see the checklist in um, augmented reality in front of you. That has a lot of value. It improves your productivity, it improves employee experience, it improves safety. Uh, and there are, there are products selling for almost $10,000 a piece on that side. So my advice for IoT startups is first look at what the product is, what are you building, both on hardware and software side, it doesn't matter where you play in, but at the end of the day, you really have to understand the value you command for your customer and how you're gonna get paid for it. And the other theme that we have seen is, we all talk about IoT, and then we start talking about sensors everywhere. And whether it is connected car or connected home or connected manufacturing facility, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of the day, sensors are going to get commoditized. So the value is going to be in the analytics and what 
smartness, what artificial intelligence engines you can put on top of the sensors, that's what you will get likely paid for. Thank you. Uh, since this is a short panel, we leave uh, 10 minutes for the question and answer. So any audience has a question, can uh, the panel can answer. So, very interesting project from Mango, right? That's his name. Um, my question is, how is he profiting from joining all the devices in one platform from this city? So, they're, I mean, it's a little different, you know, from a profitability point of view, because they're not, they're not looking to actually profit. What they're trying to do is improve the citizen's life, right? Okay. And mm -hmm. so I asked them that exact same thing about profitability and it's really it's not really part of their mandate you know the thing that's really difficult in a city is that you've got so many different departments and they all have their own agendas and what he said is everybody has a really good intentions you know to push forward IOT in particular but they have to get their job done you know they have to get their job done first so the private what he calls the public private sector relationship um, a good one is this is the Sigfox network is that the city will provide a platform so to speak for the technology the company then profits from it but the city is only essentially enhancing you know the livability of the city itself Okay, there, there is a, yeah, okay, the question is uh, how do you get the, uh, the various agencies around uh, different cities in the Bay Area to coordinate with each other so they're not getting in each other's way, trying to serve their own people, is that it? Yeah, okay, so there's a uh, problem solving technique called CPS, Creative Problem Solving, and it is a step-by-step -step process for solving problems. And the first step is who is affected? Who are the stakeholders? If you don't understand that, you're going to get it wrong, no matter what. And who, what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, why, where, and last, think about how. Because if you don't understand those other components, your how is going to be wrong. It's going to serve, create the, the wrong result. So the goal of uh, of uh, IOT would be to help different departments and different uh, communities around the area to c understand how these things impact each other. So traffic jams would be one thing, right? Uh, uh, service lacking on a certain thing in a certain area and how that impacts other areas. So that it's not just m my neighborhood a NIMBY question, it's like we're this together. And of course, that applies to the whole planet with the, you know, the 
the thing is that what we know is that if we, do, if we deal with, uh, with um, pollution and uh, waste and energy waste, everybody's going to get rich, right? We just need to do it so that we handle all of it and, and not throw away stuff and bury it under a building somewhere that if you need it later, you have to dig it up, right? Or, or throw it out in the air where people are getting sick and then you get medical bills. And so we have to kind of understand how everything impacts everything else. And that's the goal of a, of a, of a healthy IoT system and a healthy political system as well. Uh, if I could just add just a, briefly to that. Um, I think there is a new movement in cities to figure out how to use themselves as a platform for innovation. And I neglected to talk about that under partnerships, but mostly because it's so new. We're of trying to figure it out real time. San Francisco is clearly in the lead. San Jose has made some great strides. And then there are a lot of cities like Fremont and others who are trying to get into that game. But it's, it's a fundamentally different kind of way of interacting than we have in the past where it's purely purchaser vendor kind of a, a partnership, right? We are looking for something where we are uh, trying to scale a new technology and using ourselves as an example. We're very facilities laden. We're, we're very ripe for innovation in this area. And I would say that those of us, like myself, who are serving as chief innovation officers for our cities are actually very closely connected and gaining a lot of insight and also strength in numbers in terms of convincing uh, the larger political bureaucracy from within, which actually in Fremont is quite lean um, in terms of the benefits of being able to do this. So for example, um, in Fremont, we've been working on a uh, grid resiliency project where we're putting uh, power storage at fire stations so in an emergency situation they can rely on their you know, independent uh, power storage. Um, this could be something that could be implemented nationwide and we're trying it here first. So I think there, it, it's, it's nascent at this point, but uh, we actually are collaborating more than ever and uh, the Bay Area is small enough where we actually do see each other and talk to each other and collaborate quite frequently. I just want to add one point too, just to get to the point of borders and how do we go past borders. So, so the issue is that IoT is not a political issue, meaning voters don't, aren't identifying IoT, right? I mean, and so when I asked Miguel, you know, something very similar to that, I said, is this, a, is this on the political agenda? Is, is IoT something that people care about? Now, I, I live and breathe it, right? So I'm always IoT in, IoT out. And he goes, no, people don't really think about that. They think about what the benefits are. And so what he's trying to do is create this platform but he didn't think, he, he thought that before um, you'd be able to, and I'm extrapolating, before you're going to get across borders between, let's say, you know, Fremont and, and Santa Clara, there has to be some killer app that people want. GIS isn't that. No one cares about GIS. What they do care potentially about is, is traffic. And so if there's some way, you know, that, that you can provide some killer app, you know, to people, then they might demand it from their politicians, and then you'll and then you'll see it across borders. But um, again, the issue is not a technology one; it's really just it's a human it's a human issue. Okay. I mean, I can speak just quickly. The, the, big, the big three are uh, sanitation, so picking up the garbage, making sure it's, you know, it, it's done on time. Um, electricity management, so, so uh, moving, moving electricity around for the cheapest, you know, for the cheapest amount of possible, and then parking, right? But you see, these are all verticals, and when they're all verticals and they don't talk to each other, there's not, it, it's really hard to get that to get that escape velocity. So it's not going to be until, I don't think it's going to be until cars are talking to buildings that you're going to really see something that's really interesting. But right now it's vertical, so we're taking baby steps and we're taking them in all these vertical directions. But, um, but you know, it's going to take a while. 
I, I agree with the vertical part, but I think from a political viewpoint, you know, one of the hot buttons right now is security, right? Yeah, and so I think that's going to be a hot button, and it's something that everybody understands, is excited about, or you know, sentimental about, and I think that's where also collaboration among cities, regions, whatever, is going to be very important. This is where I think the cameras are going to be, you know, as, as a domain that I'm familiar with, uh, and, and the analytics that go with it are going to be very critical. This was just one example. But also traffic monitoring, right, which is, can be done with stationary cameras, can be done, done with drones. So I think there may be some other applications like that going forward that could be, you know, something that will grow. I would put it under two buckets. Uh, one, probably the biggest bucket being sustainability, because there are a lot of mandates that governments need to comply with, both that are, are mandated by, uh, you know, state or federal government, uh, mostly in California, the state, <laughs> um, but also by the community themselves. Um, a lot of communities are, are seeking uh, broader sustainability goals for their city, and so the cities actually have climate action plans that hold their feet to the fire to make tangible uh, progress on those issues, and they cannot do it alone. They absolutely must have the partnership of the private sector in meeting those goals, and that covers waste, it covers you know, all, all kinds of things. And then the other broad category I would put in under is safety, which would include security. It would also, I think, to a large part, include transportation. And my favorite killer app, by the way, and I think our uh, Public Works Director Hans Larson mentioned this at a previous WellEx forum at the county, uh, but the, the one where, as a pedestrian, when you're crossing the street, if you have the right app on, it pings the car that's coming toward you to let you know, like, hey, I'm in the crosswalk, <laughs> please pay attention. Uh, <laughs> as a driver, I want one of those, because sometimes, you know, pedestrians are hard to see. And so, I, that, I, wonderful examples of, of uh, some killer apps out there that would be very, very useful. Yeah, let me uh, add something from my personal experience. I was on a uh, committee for the you know, city of uh, Palo Alto, which is a very progressive, uh, you know, green energy city. Uh, and the committee took like five years to decide whether we would convert a landfill into a waste processing system. <laughs> and it's just uh, all the opinions on not in my neighborhood or this should be a park or you know, I don't want garbage in my neighborhood. Send it down to Richmond or send somewhere down to Watsonville. Um, so um, the role of, of IoT in, in that process is the, the CPS system. We have to look at who's affected, how are they affected, get the data out there and have, help people to understand. So you're going to make a choice between processing their garbage here or sending it down the highway, congesting traffic and polluting all the way down to Watsonville, or can they get it done here and get energy on top of it and reclaim the resources? But that data has to be available because people get emotional if they don't see the facts. Great. One more question. So uh, we actually, when we invest, we do not look at the company whether they are using an Intel product or not. Uh, it's good if they are using it, but we don't invest for that reason. And this is actually very important for us, for us as Intel Capital, because otherwise we will end up investing in companies that are collaborating only with Intel. Then why invest? They are already collaborating. Um, the reason Intel Capital exists is to create an ecosystem beyond what Intel as a company can do. So by definition, a lot of the companies that we invest in are not using Intel products today. Over time, we hope they will, but that's more like an organic system when we don't try to force it either. And once we invest, we actually, as a venture capitalist, and since we are also on the board of a lot of these companies, um, we have a responsibility to think from that startup standpoint first, and not from Intel standpoint. 
So we, and, and, and the other thing we also realize along the same lines is Intel as a company has to deserve its footing in the market, new markets for example, IoT, etc., versus us trying to push it, never happens, never, never succeeds. In the long run, at the end of the day, the product has to stand on its own. We can bring opportunities, but that's about it. Okay, just one more question, last question. technology going to uh, sort of like a big brother watching every breath you take, your heartbeat is being monitored, your blood sugar is monitored, where you're going, whom you're meeting, things like that. Is there any concerns that you think from citizens? I think it's already happening. We know you are here today. We know the question you're asking and we know where you are going next. <laughs> um, down to the blood level and everything, the data is going to get out there. The question is, yeah, the question is how do you control the data? Who has access to that data? You as a consumer decide that at the end of the day. Um, the apps that you use, they do ask you for your opt-in or they should. If they are not, then that's wrong. Uh, so they have to value user privacy. But, it, but I think we also, we also have to realize we are in a free world. Uh, where people are putting all kinds of information on Facebook, here's what I did, here's what I cooked, here's what I, how I'm feeling now and everything. I think it's just a new era that we have to get used to um, today. And at the same time, there are technologies, there are companies coming up that are giving you options to protect your data. But it's up to you as a consumer to make sure whether you use them or not. And the other thing I feel is, in the, whenever this kind of question comes up, at the end of the day, I, I have a thesis that consumers actually, they will f they feel that they care about it, but they will not take any action until they actually lose any money. If it's a financial impact, oh, they'll step on it and do something about it. Short of that, it's all like, all right, whatever. I just want to add one thing. I think data is becoming the new currency. So now, you know, we've, we've been talking about privacy is, is effectively the issue that you're bringing up. So ask yourself this. I can get a door lock, and so if I go in the store and I get a deadbolt, it's around $29, 20, $20, let's say. If I, get, if I get an August lock, it's around $220, so about 10 times. Now, the issue of consumer business models came up earlier, and it's really tough because you've got all this back end, and then people don't necessarily want to just pay for this. So now, the currency is, and the new business models are, sell that data to others in exchange for giving the product cheaper. So I think the question everybody, they are going to answer is there has to be this explicit exchange of, of, of value, and that, that it is potentially a lower price for my information but I think that's, that's, the business models are changing and then everyone's gonna have to decide whether they're willing to spend that currency. But I can tell you, I got the worst directions in the world. Even in my small town, I live in Pleasanton, I, I put it on if I'm in a rush. So Google knows exactly where I live, they know where I shop, they know where all my friends are, but that's okay because it's a really good product and so I've made that explicit exchange and I think you're gonna see just more and more, more and more of that, but the hard part you know, is going to be getting this. Is going to be getting this um, permission. I just set up an Echo, an Amazon Echo, yesterday. I read through all my. I read through the, the app. I read through the box. Nowhere they're recording everything at all times. Uh, they're listening everything at all times. Nowhere in there did it give me my privacy. My, my privacy choices, other than I can. There's a physical turning on and off the mu the mute the the mic. You lost, you lost. Maybe when I purchased it online, yeah, somehow it said you accept everything, you, accept you know. Everything. But you know, this is something that's, and so it's interesting because, I mean, I don't think we're running out of time, but, but um, I interviewed the chief privacy officer of ADT, so you know, the home security company, and he actually sent me a document on always on listening uh, regulations. So the government is, is working on all this stuff, but it's going to take... It's going to take a bit of time before it's all sorted out. 
Okay, I think uh, we're running out of time. Uh, this is the end of our panel.